say mingling sessions. And uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to welcome uh, Soren Auer, uh, who is the professor uh, in uh, Hanover University. So uh, you are like an expert in linked data from Germany. So I, re I recently bought a cryptographic tool, and now they use like made in Germany, you know, like cryptography made in Germany as like a, you know, a key word, like to, to you know, the marketing word. So I'm w I was wondering if you would be, uh, you wouldn't be like linked data made in Germany, because you are like an expert in linked data, and you have been like, working with, with it, uh, with uh, the industry for many years, and you're gonna talk about that, so uh, thanks for being here. And uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm really happy to be here because I think the topic of linked data or more general maybe uh, knowledge graphs and antique technologies doesn't yet deserve uh, or have the attention in the industry which it deserves. So there is a huge potential, I think, um, and many challenges we can only solve from my perspective when using more semantic technologies, whether you call it linked data or knowledge graphs or vocabulary ontologies that doesn't really matter, or cognitive data. Uh, what matters is that we have um, semantics in there and, and connect them. Um, so I'm very happy. Thank you very much for the invitation. I really like that uh, you assembled as a community and you bring that to one particular vertical. But I also think it's very important that we, and especially link data and knowledge graphs yeah, for connecting also different communities. And I think in the age of digitization, we have much more of this interdisciplinarity and. Uh, we want to support the flow of data between different disciplines, different um, departments, different organizations. I think that's an important aspect. But maybe let's let me start a bit more in general. Um, how did it all start? If we look back, this is from 1944. Uh, one of the first computers that SUSE Z3, Konrad SUSE was developing uh, this thing with like thousands or hundreds, thousands of registers at that time. And why am I showing you this picture? Because at that time, computing was very much related to what was possible at that time. Yeah, what was possible with regard to the um, physical um, hardware which you had at, at your hands. Yeah, and later it evolved in the 70s, 80s. Maybe some of you remember that time when we had your programming like this in assembler. Uh, so still, you now didn't have to push and pull registers or or do something with punch cards, so it was not a physical activity anymore. Um, there was a level of abstraction already, but still you were shifting information or data from one register to another still. Yeah, so very much tied to the, uh, still to the hardware abilities of the hardware. Um, so then a computer scientists came up, or computer engineers, uh, and thought, yeah, maybe that's not the most intuitive way how we do this here, yeah? And uh, they were got inspired by something which we do already for hundreds, if not even thousands of years as humans. Uh, we have cook recipes, yeah, and of course all kinds of other instructions, uh, which tell us how to bake a carrot cake, for example. Yeah, we have ingredients. We have then a procedure how to uh, stir and mix the ingredients, how to cook something, and that's of course more intuitive than than this one here, right? And then procedural programming was introduced where we organized. Uh, um, processing and functions and um, um, instructions which basically said what has to, go, uh, uh, to be done uh, when. So it's already more intuitive than assembler programming, but of course was not the end. I guess the next step you can already imagine. Um, <coughs> so this is um, actually an object from China, uh, I think 2000 before Christ. And it's an, an object which not only looks nice, but it also has a function. It actually you can burn scent um, candles in there and make a nice room atmosphere with it. Yeah? So it has a nice form, but it also has a function. Uh, you can also take it um, at these handles on the side. Um, and that's, I think, when computer science came up, oh, maybe we should um, even go make it more intuitive yeah, than, than procedural functional programming. And they went to object-oriented programming. Yeah? You organize information in objects and you associate functions and methods with these objects, more intuitive. But I think now, this was like 20 years ago, meanwhile we use object-oriented programming everywhere, uh, but the data often is hidden there. Yeah? It's hidden in some databases, encapsulated in some um, um, objects, and. I think we have to reveal also the data and the information, the semantics more out and, and make it a first class citizen of, of software development, which is currently not, not yet that much in order to 
uh, maybe even make it more intuitive and more as we um, digest information as humans. Yeah, if you think further in the way of um, computing becoming more intuitive, the most intuitive way is how, how we do this, and that's a conceptual processing, of course, not completely clear how it's done in our brains, but uh, probably it's done a bit differently than, than what object-oriented programming does. Um, and it also might help us then maybe to transfer information and knowledge between brains, how, how, how we do that, yeah? Um, so I think we need to go this uh, next step. And of course, it's also related to general developments like uh, big data, machine learning are big topics. Um, why aren't these big topics? I actually uh, don't think that uh, machine learning um, did a big, big breakthrough in the last years. Machine learning is pretty much the same as it was 20 years. There were incremental improvements, uh, but what changed is the computing power. We can now uh, process actually sizable amounts of data, and we have the data. 20, 30 years ago, there was no data to do machine learning or only toy data. Now we really have the data, and that's what this slide shows. Actually, the algorithms, they were proposed long ago already, um, and once the data set became available, then a few years later, actually, you had a breakthrough in artificial intelligence because you could combine the algorithms with the data sets and then, uh, for example, do speech recognition or you could uh, win in chess uh, after you had digitized 7,000 chess games and learned from those chess games. Uh, IBM Watson could uh, answer Jeopardy questions only after we came up with um, Wikipedia, for example, and many other wiki projects, also DBpedia played a role there. In, in order to answer that and knowledge graphs and so on and so forth. So I think the availability of data is, is um, very important. And for this, of course, linked data, and that's what we are working on, um, is, is crucial because I think those use cases where you have the data basically on one big hard disk, they are already exploited. So the use cases in the future for AI and artificial intelligence is where we can, where we have to aggregate data from different sources, heterogeneous data and, and combine it. So, and that's also like in big data, there are these classical Vs like volume, velocity, variety. Of course, there were some more added veracity, for example, value. Um, but I think even in those uh, initial classical three, uh, there was not so much attention yet on variety. And I think that's exactly what we focus on with linked data to tackle this variety, to integrate data from different sources uh, in different modalities, in different governance structures, and uh, different data structures, um, and make it more accessible. And I don't have to explain to you how linked data works, you all know that, you use it. Um, so the key is to identify things uniquely and then uh, return such a uh, description in RDF format. Um, and um, like, uh, and uh, this actually also shows, I think, link data and RDF is actually much simpler than XML or many other data models. Yeah, it just um, came a bit late. It, uh, and a big mistake from my point of view was that the first standard, RDF standard, the serialization uh, was um, explained in XML, or the first standardized serialization was even for me as a young PhD student at the time, it took me half a year to understand because you encode uh, a graph data model inside a tree, like a, if you look at XML, it's a DOM tree, right? So encoding a graph inside a tree, uh, it's a bit mind-boggling, yeah? Although, um, I think the RDF data model is very simple, and um, unfortunately, only in the last years, I think more um, the simplicity was, was also positioned a bit more in the, in the public, so, and I think it's also a very intuitive way of organizing information, because that's how we how we speak, right? We speak in sentences consisting of subject, predicate, and object. And we can convey very complicated information using speech or using text, for example. And I think that's uh, what RDF also does. And we can, of course, attach more information to the object of the first sentence and use it as a subject for the next sentence. And we can start spinning a small knowledge graph, right? Um, Still, we can serialize it in these triples and publish them either on the intranet or on the web and then easily aggregate triples from different sources. Yeah? So the data integration is already built in into simple data integration and I think that's one of the biggest advantages of RDF. Um, and of course, you can build larger knowledge graphs like this one here, for example, representing information about logistics company and you can attach labels in different languages and data types uh, here it's a bit more technical with namespace prefixes. You can, it's not 
doesn't have to be on one single machine or on one single um, entity, but can also be distributed and linked to different uh, locations, like for example here to DBpedia, and you can get more information uh, from other sources. Um, and this um, flexibilities, like vocabularies, and that's maybe a bit the data integration is split into two parts. We have the low level syntactic and low level semantic part that's covered by the triples, like subject, predicate, object. Whenever there are lots of triples, you can just merge them and the low level integration is solved. Of course, on the higher level, we need these vocabularies, yeah? And you need to reuse vocabularies. Otherwise, you still have to do a lot of mapping and linking um, in order to integrate it. But the RDF data model, despite its simplicity, I think is very flexible. You can represent relational data and lots of other data models in RDF and uh, break the mold a bit and, and have more flexibility. Maybe I illustrate that with some examples, like relational, if you have a table in your database which looks a bit like that, yeah, you can uh, represent it in RDF by simply creating a property for each column using the primary key as identifier, creating some kind of identifiers from the primary key, and then each cell basically becomes a triple. Like here, for example, this cell, Smart TV, uh, becomes that triple, and uh, the third one, um, yeah, 104 centimeters, becomes the uh, third triple, yeah? So that's, um, and there is even a standard meanwhile by W3C, the R2RML standard, which um, provides a mapping language where you can um, have a standard for mapping relational databases to RDF. But we can also represent taxonomic data, like here is a small taxonomy with like vehicles, car, bus, truck, and um, sim uh, similarly you can represent that easily in, in RDF. And we have the possibility to express even logical axioms. Maybe I actually think for industrial applications, this is not so crucial yet. Uh, maybe later on, it's good if you can check some consistencies. And um, it's currently quite quite important for, for example, the life sciences. They make quite uh, big use also of logical axioms. But I think it's good if we can start simple and later on add more constraints, add more structure, and discover maybe inconsistencies or, or uh, problems and that's exactly what RDF allows to moderate between different data models and um, uh, and also to have an iterative way of going step by step from low level representation to more expressive ones and I think that's exactly what we need if we look in companies we often have different departments and different departments uh, translate to different viewpoints <coughs> and they also have different viewpoints on the data on the information on the knowledge in the company of course so I think we need this flexibility because um, a relational database will always represent one particular viewpoint, but with RDF, with vocabularies, we have the possibility to encode and maybe to uh, moderate between these different viewpoints. For example, if you produce something, you have an engineering department, you have the manufacturing department, you have the logistics department, and in the end, the marketing department and they all have their own view on the thing uh, and different kinds of information are important so they need to be able of course to agree on something like a core vocabulary or data model and then incrementally enrich and, and uh, add their own viewpoint to it and um, allow others to reuse that and that's what I think vocabularies, knowledge graphs allow to structure and represent information in this way so overall I think there are like different strategies for integrating data and um, semantically um, and we can distinguish a bit whether they are used in a single organization or more between organizations yeah for example in a single organization you can use something like a semantic data lake a data lake which uh, is equipped or um, yeah with, with some semantics for uh, representing <laughs> describing the structure and the meaning of the data, um, and which integrates maybe also with existing big data processing techniques. Um, and then we have um, knowledge graphs, which play here a role for this uh, semantic data lakes. And then once you want to use it uh, between organizations, um, we create, can create something like data spaces where community of stakeholders agree on certain um, standards for data access, but also for security, for governance, for semantics, for licensing, 
Um, and there the focus, of course, is on data sharing and exchange. And I think that's also a very important area. So one is more internally inside an enterprise, another one externally. And I want to uh, go a bit more um, in depth in there. Like if we look at knowledge graphs, um, which you can think of as a aggregation of maybe different types of linked data or vocabularies. Um, it's a fabric of uh, concepts, class, property, relationships, entity descriptions. Should use some uh, formal representation formalism. I try to define this here a bit because, of course, uh, there are lots of people talking about knowledge graphs. Everybody has a different viewpoint. Um, and another important aspect there is this um, um, holistic knowledge representation that we have different domains, different sources, also different levels of granularity. Yeah? Um, and uh, this should be supported by, by a knowledge graph. So this can be, for example, instance data, the ground truth, which again can be open data, but also private data in the supply chain, which you share with certain partners, or really close data, product models, which you uh, protect with, uh, with IP, for example. Um, but it also can include derived aggregated data, um, uh, schema, like vocabularies, ontologies, metadata, taxonomies to categorize entities, links between internal and external data. And then I think very important are these mappings to store um, to data which is stored in other systems. Because of course we will not succeed in only having leaked data out there. And there should uh, all these different uh, information systems, databases, they should stay in place. And they are very important. Uh, what we need is a bit more glue and uh, we need to expose them to the uh, to link data and creating, managing these mappings, I think is then another important aspect. Mappings from this um, uh, original data in the uh, productive systems to, to such a knowledge graph. And then we can actually use this knowledge graph also for novel use cases for applications. Um, everybody talks about digitization nowadays, um, but I think there is, um, for digitization, we want to, in a, in a Often people start talking about new use cases. What can I do? Um, and uh, But I think the difficulty is actually realizing these new use cases. And when we can create such a data architecture, semantic data architecture, then it's very easy to realize new use cases. Currently, a lot of time and effort is, is spent, I don't want to say wasted, on integrating, getting access to the data, integrating it and mapping it and so on. And of course, this already happens. There are lots of these knowledge graphs out there. So maybe um, the largest one, uh, meanwhile, uh, Google has. Yeah, They built a huge knowledge graph. They acquired Freebase already 10 years ago. Meanwhile, they hired lots of people also from the semantic web community, research community who are working now at Google. And they use the schema.org initiative. Of course, it's an initiative also where other search engines, Bing and um, Yahoo, Baidu, Yandex uh, contributed or involved, um, and also many users. Actually, it's organized on GitHub. Everybody can submit change requests and um, and submit issues there on schema.org. Um, and this is, uh, meanwhile, quite popular, and uh, many websites use that. And Google fills its knowledge graph with all this information from from the websites. It crawls from from websites, and I think. Uh, we need actually something similarly for the enterprise world, more for internal data. Of course, there are some first attempts in that direction, but I think uh, we need something like schema.org for enterprise uh, data. Uh, this focuses, of course, a lot of web and e-commerce and web data. And then we have in the life science a lot of initiatives like Open Facts or BioPortal, where they organize, curate data ontologies and semantics for a long time. And in the world of digital libraries, meanwhile, there is also there are a lot of vocabularies. Meanwhile, there is this Europeana initiative in Europe, for example, where thousands of memory institutions, so museums, archives, libraries, are aggregating metadata. And you can go to Europeana EU, and you can basically search the whole European cultural heritage data space. And I would say this is also a data space where uh, thousands of organizations agreed on the semantics on a semantic structure, also on licensing. All this metadata is unlicensed under a public domain. I think CC zero. So, uh, of course, it's not it's not the, the digitized artifacts. It's the metadata. But once, also with links then to the museums, and then you can retrieve the the actual or look at the actual artifacts also when they are digital.
So I want to zoom a bit into this semantic data lake idea of integrating um, data, enterprise data. So traditionally, uh, we have here exploding um, costs of data integration. If you want to integrate every data source with every data source in order to create these new applications and maybe in the future create new applications, uh, this doesn't scale. And that's exactly the idea of using such a knowledge graph that you basically map the data sources to vocabularies. You have to do this mapping only once and then you can reuse the mapping many times and create lots of, of, of new applications there. Yeah. Just, just to remark yeah. uh, about your previous slide. Um, uh, yes, we have. But uh, the big problem that we face is that you have a different layer to consume the data and to, uh, to be created by an expert or, or managed by an expert. So on your database, uh, on the down, down part of your, of your uh, you are consuming and you are creating, so the, the full crew of your, of your data uh, with a lot of people, uh, like uh, for example 100 people yeah. for each database. And at the upper level, the data lake, you are aggregate, aggregating your data to create a business value more than uh, the, the silo of the data. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the data lake itself is, is to use uh, or to consume the data as an aggregation with semantic and so on. So only consume, not creating. So be careful on the, on the this is, uh, uh, I, I would say this, uh, this, we have a problem for example in Airbus because we are promoting the data lake to consume the data, yeah. but don't forget that there is a lot of people creating the data, right. not in the data. Of course, the more we can make those people already create semantically rich structures, yeah. yeah? Uh, of course, if there is already, like in the database, you already have a mapping or you create it, you use identifiers, you think this from from the first place, the better and the easier it is to, to do this mapping later on. And then there are possibilities also to directly interact maybe with the data in a semantic way. Of course, that's ideally if you can, can do that too. I fully agree. Yeah, here it's just maybe the, the right part and with a bit more details, yeah, that um, you have then different um, consumption um, methods and can realize different use cases exactly for these different viewpoints you have in the company for accounting for management for regulatory reporting for engineering and so on and so forth um, and maybe i want to show you some examples so this is actually uh, we already five six years ago uh, we're thinking a lot we need to bring this more to the enterprise so we need more um, um, tools tooling infrastructure and we started a spin-off company it's called essensa and uh, which does meanwhile quite a lot of um, projects and activities and um, offers an infrastructure for companies to uh, to create such a knowledge graph and to exploit uh, because um, there are this potential of, of semantic data integration. Um, another aspect is also uh, to, to support that once you have a semantic in, um, representation of your internal data, you can actually use this semantic representation to sync it in your supply chain or in your value chain with other partners uh, with whom you collaborate. Uh, currently there is EDI, electronic data interchange, mainly used for that, but it's relatively rigid and structured and um, you're not so flexible to add new information and data to it. And, and that's an opportunity which arises to, to use this knowledge graphs also for, and I will come back to that, that's the aim of the industrial data space, which we created at, at Fraunhofer. Um, but in order to, um, in an enterprise, you need a bit of framework of, of how to organize the semantic integration and what are the different functionalities and uh, um, people need um, uh, tooling for, for that and uh, there are different uh, features which we integrated in this uh, CMAM, a semantic integration platform, for example, for cataloging data sets and for ingesting of existing data sets where you can describe um, the data with a metadata model um, which also performs some automatic profiling of the data sets and then integrates it actually with, the, with such a um, um, data lake um, that you can continuously also monitor for new versions and uh, structural 
changes in your data. Um, you can manage the data sets you see actually one uh, when changes when uh, when they were created or modified and um, uh, who is the owner of, of the different data sets uh, the profiling of the data sets basically looking into the data and creating an aggregated view what kind of data types are used there what properties um, excuse um, me sorry yeah. uh, just something on the slide before I didn't, I didn't understand uh, is it like uh, what you do? You you uh, you give some like uh, structured data, whatever the format, to your tool, and you extract automatically some like linked data vocabulary out of it. Is it is it right? Yeah, um, there are some suggestions. I think the quality of doing this completely automatically is relatively low. So there is always some curation, and what we actually want to establish um, more a culture that you maybe of course that you have these automatic techniques. Uh, combined with manual creation of the mappings um, and that you also don't have to do everything I talk often large companies they think oh we have here these thousand databases now we need to start a big project three years of mapping everything um, I think uh, it's much better to, to do this step by step iteratively you have a certain use case you create a mapping and RDF and vocabularies allow you that yeah with XML technologies was not possible you needed to create a schema um, and then you needed to stick to this schema. With RDF it's possible to start with the vocabulary and then to incrementally enrich it and improve it. And that's uh, exactly what, what we try to do where you co have different methods, automatic methods combined with human curation uh, and step by step enrich uh, your semantic model basically. Yeah. And then you would use those information models in a kind of integration platform? Or? Exactly. Yeah, okay. <coughs> And um, then the mapping um, is, a, is another step, so also suggesting we, we integrated, for example, also some machine learning methods to learn from existing usage of the data or from uh, the data types which are found in the columns of a, of a columnar data set, for example, to suggest mappings, uh, to create such a data dictionary, normalize the data, map it to vocabularies, um, uh, to then also uh, calculate similarity or relatedness between data sets to uh, be able to visually explore in some way a part of this uh, knowledge graph which emerges out of these kind of mappings and uh, structure and finally also linking so some of you maybe have uh, recognized there is a famous uh, linking toolkit silk which was one of the first link data linking toolkits developed by Robert Isler he already for uh, many years now works at uh, Essenza and uh, the Silk tool was integrated also in this uh, CMEM stack basically uh, for linked data integration. Uh, and you can create these declarative mapping rules because often you have overlapping data sets. So uh, it's not the case that all your data sets are disjoint, but you have customers in different databases and data sets, and then you need to link and integrate that. And Silk allows you to learn. For example, there is an active learning um, uh, behind so you can actually uh, give some examples of links um, mm -hmm. positive and negative examples and Silk will ask you for for more feedback on uh, the ruled um, linking rules and you can also of course refine them uh, manually but often already five or ten of these feedback cycles are sufficient to have relatively high precision in data linking of course it depends a lot on the data quality mm -hmm. but if you have well curated data uh, then it's relatively uh, straightforward. If your data is more noisy, then also the linking, of course, cannot uh, work as efficiently. Clarification. So you 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 when you're working with the vocabularies in your graph and with the and, data, um, is this? Yeah, sorry, of course. Uh, uh, learning. Do you use any like uh, OWL or that kind of? Sure, you can use everything, RDF, RDF schema, yeah. OWL, and then domain-specific vocabularies. Yeah, mm -hmm. so to create. Uh, the mappings from your original data to these domain specific or, or generic uh, data models and then to link also the data between different data sources. And what is that then? Is that some? That's the data linking. Of course, is it uses mm -hmm. already the vocabularies and the ontologies you have, for example. Uh, yeah. You have, you have properties um, like the name of a customer, for example, would be this here, and then you combine and apply some string metrics like Java Winkler. Yeah, and and how do you declare these rules? Is it its own? It's a, because then it's not part of the vocabulary, right? Is it just another technology? Uh, uh, you can draw them on this canvas here. 
Uh, you can just the drag the and drop the boxes, yeah. or you can do this learning. That's what I initially mm -hmm. uh, like tried to explain. You you select two data sources you, which you want to link, and then um, Silk in the background looks uh, which data entries look similar, and then it asks you, is this the same as that one? And you click yes or no, and in the end it comes up with exactly something like this. So if you are too lazy, or I don't know, to um, if that's too cumbersome for you, you can just answer some questions, mm -hmm. and so it will come learn a rule, a linking rule, and then you can apply it on your whole data. Yeah. Of it's course, it, it's trained on some examples. Yes, and, and just like another question I have, like so you you do this uh, process, learning process, and manual process as well for setting the links, and then you push this information model in production, so it's being used by your uh, integration platform. But then the information model itself uh, might also evolve over time. So can you also like uh, push some uh, updates, you know, some diffs of your information model and of the links uh, into the integration platform again? Is it like something a bit, bit something dynamic that you? Yeah, do? yeah. it's um, mm. very, um, of course, dynamic. Uh, but there are many um, many questions which have to be solved a bit to the. To the company, for example, yeah. we had companies. They had a certain council which wanted to agree or right. create certified, uh, agreed on versions of the vocabulary. Yeah, and but mm -hmm. uh, you can use, uh, for example, also some versioning like Git in the background for mm -hmm. the vocabularies, and you can have different branches for your development version of the vocabularies of the mapping rules. Mm -hmm. and then at certain times, you can have certain um, agreed upon. Um, uh, versions and which are then released and, and used and widely more widely in the company but that depends a bit on the governance structure and what existing yeah. often there is for example master data management department or other departments which already have a bit a similar role in the company and uh, they already have established procedures and that needs to be uh, taken into account yeah. you have a question yes thank you um, but do I understand correctly, this silk workbench will also only allow for read-only um, approach, so basically uh, it would not provide a link data interface to uh, all the applications from where information was extracted in the first place? That's um, right, we, like there are of course also approaches to, to accomplish that using for example APIs, but it depends a bit, you cannot generically or, or in a fully agnostic way say how the data should be updated, but one uh, direction is uh, using some some rest mechanism or of course also the the solid um, uh, approach of of read and writing uh, stuff using or api some companies have already an api infrastructure in place for for that um, but that's definitely uh, of course, what also comes with it is a, is a triple store. You can always also store something in your triple store and then you can use, of course, all the operations, uh, Sparkle update and whatever um, is possible there. Okay, so this was um, a bit um, a brief overview of uh, how such an infrastructure could, could look like or how we are currently already deploying it in different scenarios. Another aspect is this um, intra-organizational data exchange. And uh, there uh, we started at Fraunhofer an initiative called Industrial Data Space. Actually now it's called International Data Spaces. So um, because uh, the initial focus on industrial got a bit more broadened. And uh, the idea is there also, of course, to support use cases um, of digitization where you use uh, need data from an ecosystem which is not under a single control. like. Uh, for example, for precision farming, you need weather data from a weather service. You need data from your equipment manufacturer, from um, the farming equipment, from seed providers, from the farmers, from wholesalers, from technology providers. So this is a whole ecosystem um, and uh, you need mechanisms to exchange that. Of course, the traditional answer to that is let's create a big cloud and store everything into a single cloud. And some companies are quite successful. We see that in the consumer space that there are two, three dominant players. And one danger, of course, is that uh, we in Europe get a bit dependent on these uh, global players. And uh, we wanted to um, develop um, an, another model which allows a more distributed and decentralized data sharing <coughs> approach. Um, based on several principles like decentralizing sovereignty over your data, you decide with whom you want to share something. Uh, common governance rules, ecosystem, 
uh, some kind of openness or neutral vendor neutral access to the data and here is a blueprint of this original architecture of the industrial data space um, I'm not very actively now working on the industrial data space anymore but my colleagues at Farnhofer are continuing this and with quite some drive as well and the idea is really that as you has a, have a website every company nowadays has a website uh, you have a data space connector which allows you to connect and um, share some data you have with other trusted parties yeah, which can be uh, also cloud providers but also individual other companies and of course you have some kind of vocabularies and maybe some apps these apps can be mappings from typical uh, information systems or vocabularies um, from data sorry is the connector uh, meant to be a web API or just exactly okay yeah. and it also follows for example rest and um, okay um, many of these modern standards. Actually, what I showed you before, the, the Essenza Link Data Platform, CMEM, um, is uh, also compatible with the industrial data space, but it's not yet, it's still a bit in the process, it's not yet a fully standardized um, um, or portfolio of standards, but it's still a bit in, in, the, in the process of being, um, yeah, also in parallel to this architecture, there are some use cases which are developed, and uh, the idea is, especially also to, to support um, the, the exchange of data between different industries and different verticals, yeah? and not only focusing on one vertical. Because there, of course, we had already a lot of data integration initiatives which focused on particularly one vertical. And, yeah, and that also hopefully can create maybe a bit of data layer, so you not only have a data layer inside your company, uh, but you have a data layer between companies for exchanging data between different companies to bridge between those Internet of Things on the low level and these high level smart services or digitized applications. And I think uh, we need more attention, especially on this data governance layer to exchange data between companies. Okay, since I don't have time, maybe just a few screenshots of this cultural heritage data space. You can go to Europeana EU or in Germany to ddb.de and you have a search interface and um, you can search in this metadata and uh, for example if you search for Goethe you can do some faceted browsing and search for objects in the city you are currently located and then if you are a Goethe aficionado then uh, go exactly to the museums or archives where they have some interesting objects and I think it uses uh, this industrial uh, uses similar ideas like and, uh, data, it's also a data space and I think it's a bit of pattern which we can discover and I think there will be more of these data space hopefully in the future coming up. Yeah, so conclusion we need I think um, for AI, for realizing the promises of AI and digitization we need uh, these um, cognitive data and maybe also hybrid AI. Often actually in AI projects 70% of the effort is data integration and uh, description of the data and this uh, semantic approach can help there uh, to realize a lot of new um, possibilities. I think integration with crowdsourcing also inside an enterprise, maybe we shouldn't call it crowdsourcing, maybe something like expert sourcing. Um, and that's what schema.org, from my perspective, made schema.org really successful because everybody can submit uh, some push requests or pull requests on, on GitHub and some issues there and many people do that and uh, that really uh, improves uh, the schema.org incrementally and steadily um, and we need also some more maybe agile interoperability, not only focusing on these traditional standards but on vocabularies which evolve, which are living and are driven forward by a community in a more agile way. Yeah. And GDPR, although it's a bit of a burden for companies, I think it can be also a driver because the GDPR forces companies a bit more to think systematically about personal data and we can apply the same techniques actually then also for other types of data, not only personal data. Maybe we can create something like a uh, um, out of this burden um, um, benefit for, for enterprises. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thanks.
Yes, uh, Soren, uh, since we are like running a bit out of time, I think uh, <laughs> Jan always wants to. But yes, but, uh, but Soren. Uh, I will be here a whole day. So. And you're like, you will be attending the panel discussion right now. Yeah. So I will bring a chair, a special chair for you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and maybe Jan will have a, a new opportunity for, for questions.